right, Dr. Kastromarin, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, gentle reminder to uh, mute your phones if you're not uh, speaking. Uh, we will hello, call. Hello. This... Sorry, hello. It's Go ahead. Sorry. Hi, Charlie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, please mute, mute your phones. Please mute your phones. Thank you. Um, we'll call this meeting to order at noon. Uh, protocols, medications, and devices standing committee. Uh, Shelley, please go ahead with the roll call. All right, Amber Rice. Uh, here, Shelley. Thank you. Brian Smith. Here. Chester Key. Uh, Franco Castro Marin. Here. Darth Gamer. Here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Heather Miller. On the phone. And Chester Keys on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jason Johnson. Jason Payne. Joshua Gaither. I, I heard yep. you earlier. Uh, Matt Shaw. Uh, Neil Gago. Yep, I'm here. Sorry. Here. Paul Dabrowski. And Shari Brand. Here. All right, we have quorum. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I just do one more mic check? Uh, I'm being told there's some feedback. Is everybody okay with me here? I hear you yeah, fine. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Shelley. So on the chairman's uh, report, uh, we've got the um, attendance report, which is attachment 3A. Can we see that on the screen, please? Second. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, can we get? Uh, thank you. I heard a second there. Did I? Did I, I didn't hear it first. To approve the attendance report. Oh, sorry. We're not. Sorry, we're not, not, not a voting item. item. Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, any uh, any issues with the attendance report? And just a reminder: if you miss two consecutive meetings, uh, the uh, uh, bureau will call you to uh, make sure that you're interested in continuing uh, to be a member. Um, let's uh, welcome two new members, uh, Dr. Paula Dabrowski and Dr. Sherry Brand. Uh, thank you both uh, for, for choosing to serve on PMD. Uh, we're very excited to uh, um, have you guys with us. And um, the uh, third issue on the chairman's report is uh, the uh, PMD bylaws are due for review. Um, does anyone have a comment on that? I can make a quick make comment. A quick comment. Just so there's someone on the line that has two lines open. If you're on the computer and also calling in, you need to have only one line open. Otherwise, we're going to get a lot of feedback. He may have just fixed it. Okay. Uh, so about, about the bylaws, this is just an awareness. We do need to update these this year. We have a very full agenda today. Uh, so the goal will be just to make sure these are available in the packet for people to review and make recommendations for the meeting next time around, so the next meeting. All right, um, if we could just take a pause for just a moment, I just want to make sure that my audio is not the one causing the problem. So let me uh, dial in to the uh, meeting as well. Stand by, give me two minutes, give me one minute. Okay. <laughs> 
Can you guys hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. Is that a little bit better? Less feedback, hopefully? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, thank you. Let's go ahead and move on. Uh, Bureau report, EMS for children. Julia? Um, hi. So the biggest update is that we are working on a safe sleep for EMS education module. Um, we did not have that. <laughs> Today's education committee meeting, but hopefully by the next one we'll be able to get that approved and move on in that process. So we'll have upcoming meetings to work on that again. Ben, do you have anything else to add for the Bureau? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the discussion and action items. Um, I need a, a, a motion to approve the PMP minutes from November 21st. Can we see that on the screen, please? Please take a moment to review the minutes and we'll uh, I'll need a motion to approve. So we'll move, Brian. This is Amber, second. All right, so Brian and Amber, thank you. Um, any discussion? All right, um, uh, all those uh, who approve the minutes uh, say aye. 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 Are there any names? All right, uh, the uh, uh, motion to approve the minutes is approved. All right, so the next um, action item is to discuss amend and approve the drug profile, which is attachment 5B. To initiate discussion, I'll move to approve. For Gamer, thank you. Do I hear a second? Second, Brian. This is Matt. I second. Thank you. All right. Let's open the discussion on the drug profile, attachment 5B. So just to give a little bit of update for those of you who are on the computer or have it in front of you, uh, this is Gail. Uh, we have left some of the comments on them in red where we wanted to just discuss them and also some highlights in yellow where there is no consistent information out there or there's a few questions. So uh, it depends how the group wants to go through those, but just to identify that the reason there's some red comments are those are the ones we specifically need to discuss. Uh, and then the highlighted areas are things where I could not find any consistent information. All right, so then why don't we just go ahead and go quickly uh, page by page. We've got the title page, we've got a table of contents. Um, uh, Dr. Bradley, any uh, issues or suggestions with the table of contents based on what you and I have gone through with the Central Arizona um, uh, regional guidelines, if we want to group them or uh, perhaps group them by an alphabet or something to make this page a little bit easier to navigate, or, or are there few enough entries that this seems appropriate? Uh, I think this is alphabetical. Uh, no, I, I know alphabetical, but I mean, if this goes on electronic format, uh, would it make sense to just um, have a, 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 a drill down menu for easier navigation, or, or is this short enough that we can leave that in it? Uh, I don't think you could do a, dr a drill down with the drug profile since it's each individual drug. Got it. Um, all right, so page four, uh, looks like there's no uh, comments on that one. And page five, uh, albuterol, um, our first comment here is um, uh, contraindications or systemic uh, tachycardia. So th those comments were actually mine. 
um, symptomatic tachycardia. So my understanding of the, of the data here is that there is symptomatic tachycardia. We all know that and have experienced it clinically, but the issue is that this is usually clinically meaningless and that uh, you know, most experts would agree that, you know, addressing the bronchospasm uh, is a bigger priority clinically than secondary tachycardia. Um, and so uh, I wanted to suggest that we either soften the word to say that the soft, uh, symptomatic tachycardia that is usually clinic, uh, clinically insignificant or somehow soften that it is not, uh, absolutely not an absolute contraindication and that treatment should continue uh, in an effort to uh, address the bronchospasm. And same under precautions and side effects. Sorry, we're having trouble with the version. Or Well, maybe just to discuss that um, those with, you know, chest pain related to tachycardia or something specific uh, rather than just symptomatic tachycardia, because like you said, it's vague and doesn't really indicate why the contraindication is there. But for patients with cardiac disease and chest pain related to tachycardia, it may be a relative contraindication, but um, I, I think that's a maybe stretching it even. So, so my so suggestion what, here, uh, go ahead, go ahead, please. Oh, uh, one way that maybe a simple fix to this would just be to delete it out of contraindications at, under precautions and side effects. I would maybe say a relative contraindication may be symptomatic tachycardia, so it kind of puts the relative in front of it. Symptomatic. Uh, and then yeah, sounds precautions good. as opposed to under contraindications. I agree. I agree that we could strike it from contraindications, remove it from contraindications, and under precautions, we can leave it to say um, uh, that last bullet, the third bullet, we could say um, uh, relatively contraindicated if, if significant tachycardia um, or tachyarrhythmias occur um, uh, or, or chest pain. Or ischemic chest pain, or angina chest pain, or something along those lines. Are we going to be doing editing uh, in real time, or do we want to just no. do this? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Any objections to that? Those comments, so we can move on. Thanks, Rachel. All right, not hearing any objections, let's move on. The uh, next page is Andy Oberon. Um, there were no comments or yellow flags on this page. This is next Ryan. Page. Go ahead, Brian. So uh, at the last meeting, I had brought up issues of um, interfacility uh, transports and so on, and whether we were going to add um, any recommendations on interfacility transports for maintenance infusions and so on? So this is only addressing the table. Th these are the 911 or table one drugs only at this time. Okay, because there was a motion made at the last meeting to add those, but that's okay. And, and at some point we will get to that, but the workload of the Bureau is being a little, has been a little heavy right now. Okay. Okay, so um, amiodarone, uh, no uh, issues. Uh, next page is aspirin. Uh, no issues on the aspirin page were identified. Um, page eight is atropine. No issues on that page were noted. Calcium chloride. My comments here uh, were on indications to remove the second bullet that it's an antidote for calcium channel blocker. While uh, while that is certainly true, 
Uh, we are not using it for this application uh, in the EMS setting. And so I didn't want to add it. Uh, I didn't want it to have any confusion there for any people referencing this document. Are there any, anybody opposed to removing that? Uh, my only thought on potentially inc including this would be if you had a uh, patient that was critically ill and the agency was to get medical direction to administer that, it is a standard of, an appropriate standard of care. We just wouldn't have a link guideline at the bottom, but it's basically an indication, kind of the national guidelines, the NISEMSO and other states included that. Um, that's, that's totally fair. So so, so what you're saying, Dr. Bradley, is that if a crew might get an offline or an online medical direction order to administer it for that indication, and then it's within scope for a paramedic to do that, even though there's no offline written for that. Correct. Concur with Dr. Bradley on that. Yeah, hey, Franco, the only other one that I, Franco, this is Amber. The only other thing that in the contraindications that I questioned was the contraindication of sarcoidosis. Um, if we're using this for critically ill patients with suspected hyperkalemia or calcium channel blocker overdose, to me, that seems like more of a, a much more relative contraindication in these really clinically significant indications for using calcium chloride. So I don't know if we want to continue striking sarcoidosis um, for this for the indications that we're using calcium chloride. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I don't even going to get that history. Yeah, I, I think it's totally I reasonable. Take it out. Yeah, I, I'm okay with taking it out as well, unless there's any uh, other comments on it. All right, so we will, uh, we will take a notation to keep the uh, two bullets under indications remove the bullet listing sarcoidosis from contraindications. Any other comments? Uh, Gail, was there anything specific that you're looking for this body to comment on the two yellow boxes? I could not find, and I know that Amber very nicely had a pharmacist from U of A review these as well, and they did not correct any of these. So these are kind of a vague unknown and varies, but that was the best onset. So I just wanted to make sure that the group felt comfortable with leading those as a more nebulous term, so that's why they were kept highlighted. Uh, and that's for calcium chloride, calcium gluconate, and uh, gel as well as IV. I'm comfortable leaving those uh, the way they are. If medical right, direction please. wants to put something there, they can. Absolutely. Um, all right, so hearing no objections for those changes, uh, we will uh, get down to page 10, calcium gluconate. Again, no other issues were identified other than those yellow areas we just addressed. Uh, the same is true with page 11. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, charcoal. Um, this is uh, um, on, a, on a subsequent action item, I believe, right? Is that how we're doing it? Um, uh, discussing possibly removing this profile, so let's uh, let's skip this page for now and come back to that uh, in just a moment. Desimethasone, no issues identified on page 13. Uh, dextrose. Um, Gail, did you want to say anything on the yellow box? Is your question just whether or not we explicitly list every single protocol or? Uh, correct. I think we just may need to make sure we've captured all of those. Nothing that else that needs to be really adjusted. Okay. Yeah, we looked at we got plenty of room on the page to make sure that they explicitly listed. I, I just want to make sure that I, my preference is that each protocol that contains that stroke do be explicitly listed so it's consistent with the other pages. It looks like we got the room for it. Um, um, Go ahead. I have a, I have a, this Brian, I have a question about in, uh, let's see here, where is it? Where it talks about if there's any evidence of malnutrition or alcohol abuse, 
Then we have the recommendation that thiamine should precede the administration of those. However, thiamine is an optional drug and people may, may not be carrying that anymore. So I'm wondering about whether we should have that in that kind of a recommendation. Because clearly there are going to maybe be Pardon? Can we just add an if available? Yeah, that would be fine. Add it down. Great pickup, Brian. And what's the what's the asterisk at the top, Gail? The AL. That is just an um, some just internal notes about what, some sourcing that we found. Okay. Uh, next page, diazepam. Uh, no uh, no issues noted. Um, oh, actually, on the top, the first bullet, uh, there's an extra space after the word drug and and the period. If we could fix that. All of your typos were fixed, yes. We just may not have the oh, right one on the screen right now. Got it. Uh, so, Gilkaizem, the next page, uh, uh, yellow flags for the administration uh, on SIS, the key can direct. This, so this, is, this is Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Um, can we go back to diazepam real quick? And down in administration, um, is rectal administration still inappropriate because that's missing in there, or is it more similar enough to IM? It doesn't matter. Um, I'd have to defer to anybody else. I, I don't know that we have anybody giving it rectally, certainly not on my agencies. Um, Because there is a specific line for diazepam rectal delivery. It's optional, but it is its own line. On, on table one. Yeah, and also to your point, Brian, it looks like under precautions and side effects, the final bullet says may give rectally if IV formulation is not available. I think in general, most agencies have transitioned to uh, midazolam or lorazepam as their anticonvulsant medications. Uh, and certainly, I don't think most EMS agencies, if they do still carry the diazepam, are doing it rectally. Uh, I think that was the rationale for moving towards the administration listing just IV and IM dosing routes. Okay. Hey, Gail. This is Amber. Hey, Franco, this is Amber. Um, for the rectal diazepam, are there a significant number of children and families who still get prescribed this? Because I know previously the issue has been that when children get this rectally at home prior to EMS arrival, because the onset is a little bit longer, then they get IV or IM, whatever. Um, and so the only reason um, I would think about including it is because if they're getting it prior to arrival, um, that delayed onset may be clinically relevant to EMS providers considering giving additional uh, benzodiazepines. I don't know how prevalent that is. I don't see it that often, but I don't primarily pediatrics anymore. So maybe someone can comment further. Would it be reasonable to capture that concern as its own bullet in the precautions uh, rather than making a specific change under the administration tab? Sure. And, and again, I don't even know how often this is still prescribed, um, but I know, you know, in the past, this is this has come up um, as an educational point, um, mostly uh, because it does get given to families who have children who have a seizure disorder. Yeah, my, uh, I, I think it's a valid concern. I would ask maybe if, if we could just create a bullet point to capture that, just saying. Uh, you know, if uh, if the patient received a rectal dose prior to EMS arrival, uh, 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 further benzodiazepine administration should be uh, 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 considered with caution. Um, and 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 then yeah, to that end, I would probably ask that we remove the other two bullets because so that again, the practicality is that they're probably not going to be uh, crews are probably not going to be giving more rectal formulation.
there's no opposition. Sure I'm going to just read back what you said to make sure we got that accurately. Uh, so we're going to remove the last two bullets and then replace those with a patient received rectal dose prior to EMS arrival. Future, uh, or for, sorry, further benzodiazepine administration should be uh, used with caution. Yeah, that that seems good. Or it should be administered with caution. Should be administered with caution. Got it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amber, for those comments. Uh, bed, uh, page 16, Dilkiasem. It looks like we got some flags with regard to administration, time of onset, peak effect, and duration. Any comments there? All right, we'll keep moving on uh, to the diphenhydramine. No issues noted. Uh, then the next page is uh, dopamine. Um, this obviously has a big flag on it because of uh, uh, our next our next uh, topic item. So let's uh, let's uh, let's table this discussion for the time being. Uh, dopamine is a two-page uh, uh, reference because of the uh, dosing table, which you see there. Uh, epinephrine. Uh, uh, so the issues here are the administration, IV and IM, uh, just a, a time of onset and uh, uh, peak effect generation. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, any so comments Tom, so these, there? Are these are just highlighted because they were very different sources in terms of the time frames that I found for these. So. That's why there's kind of different, they're just highlighted just to see, does anyone have a definitive feeling and make sure that we are, as a group are comfortable just because there is some variation depending on different sources. Okay. Um, and, and, yeah, yeah, this yeah, is- as far as I'm, Go ahead. Go. So I'm saying that if we wanna, if there's that much variability in the sources, we could just stick to the peak effect being what we recommend as being the redosing uh, interval. So we redose at intervals of we I don't remember what is in the T3G, but um, we would consider you know likely to be the peak effect of that drug potentially. So we could, if we wanted to pick a number, we could pick something close to what our redosing interval is. But that's just a suggestion. Okay, noted. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so let's uh, let's uh, keep moving just for sake of time on atomidate. No issues identified there. Uh, fentanyl, no issues. Uh, glucagon, my only comments there uh, mirror my comments on the calcium. So based on the calcium discussion, um, I'm I'm totally okay keeping those uh, for beta blocker and calcium channel blocker overdose indications. Uh, those uh, it sounds like the group would would. Uh, Suggest keeping those, and I and I'll support that. Um, next one is oral glucose, no issues. Uh, hydrocortisone is uh, removed. Hydroxycobalamin cyan cyano kit, no issues. Um, Ipratropium, uh, oh, just oh. time of onset. Go ahead. Excuse me for a second. And so, why why don't we have why don't we have one for hydrocortisone? Because it's in the it's in table one. Because uh, this the the application is that the. Um, uh, is that it's going to be the patient's own medication. Oh. This is one of those assisting the patient's own medication. Yeah, no, that's okay. I see the asterisk going back to a key now, so that's fine. Well, let me, let me actually play devil's advocate there. If, even if it is indicated, even if, it, even if it belongs to the patient, is it not a worthy endeavor to have it, this material in the, in the uh, drug, the drug guide just for the 
so that our providers know what what they're giving or what they're assisting with. I mean, it, it's just it's just information. I I support actually keeping it in that regard. It's not in any of the uh, other ones that we had pulled. Part of the reason we went back and decided uh, we're going to make the recommendation to not include it, uh, just because all the different reference ones that we looked at did not include them. Okay. Um, and, and, as, and as I was saying that, I noticed that the content of this page is actually for adenosine, even though the, the, the heading says hydrocortisone. So, um, all right. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm okay keeping it off often. Uh, next page is uh, cyanal kit, no issues. Uh, then that takes us down to page 27, hypertropium. Uh, the only issue was the time of onset, 5 to 15 minutes. That uh, I'm okay with that. If there's no objection. Uh, next page is uh, ketamine. Uh, ketamine has no, no no issues identified. Um, lidocaine. No issues identified. Uh, lorazepam, uh, just a flag under the IM uh, onset of action and duration. Uh, I'm okay with those two as well. There's no, there's no uh, comments. Uh, next page is magnesium. Um, if anybody has any comments on the peak effect of the one hour uh, duration? Okay, moving on, uh, methylprednisolone. Any comments on the administration flags? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. The tazolam. Any comments on the administration flag there? Again, this was another one that there was a lot of variation between the different sources uh, regarding the onset, peak, and duration. This might be another one, uh, another good one to take Amber's suggestion that, you know, maybe we pick a number that correlates with what our intended repeat dosing strategy should be and kind of stick with that. So we can circle back at our at the offline or at the um, guidelines page and, and kind of pick the number that fits and maybe use that as a as our guide. Um, but otherwise, I have no issues with it. All right, moving on, morphine. No issues identified there. Next page is now uh, now the theme. Um, the move here is to consider removing this because of several issues, including supply, manufacturing supplies, and uh, and uh, and others. So we'll come back to that. Naloxone. Next page. Um, any issues with the uh, administration flag flagged here? All right. Hearing none, we'll move on. Nitroglycerin. No issues were noted there. Uh, norepinephrine. Uh, no I would like to add there. one thing to nor. I would like to add one item to norepinephrine. Yeah. Uh, somewhere in here, since this is a special deal now that requires an infusion pump, um, I would like to uh, add in there administered by infusion pump. Only is wherever appropriate here. Um, we can maybe yeah. do that uh, in the precautions and side effects. Does that work? Uh, yeah, that would work. So we'll add a bullet just to make sure we capture the wording. Must be administered by infusion pump. Can we also add it next to the norepinephrine title? Just uh, in the end. In brackets, just the pump only, infusion pump only. That would be fine too, either way. Probably good to have I, it in I, both. I would, yeah, I would suggest both. Hey, Franco, uh, with Nora. Yeah. 
Franco, this is Amber. Could we talk about norepi? Just one quick thing. Um, for the use caution in cases of cardiac ischemia, for the indications that we would be using norepinephrine, and this could potentially include like post cardiac arrest and a whole bunch of other things. Um, I, I don't know that limiting limiting it by that would be helpful or potentially harmful because we would be potentially using this in cases of, you know, post cardiac arrest that could be caused by, um, you know, myocardial ischemia and things like that. And um, it would be more beneficial to prevent shock in those patients than to worry about myocardial ischemia. So I'm wondering if that contraindication or precaution is maybe a little bit overstated in light of the, the actual indications that we're using it for. Maybe other comments yes, from the group you. would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. That's a great catch, Amber. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that that's kind of overstated and, and, and contrary to what we intend to happen on a call. What do you think about just deleting that last bullet? Agreed. All right. Uh, I hear no further comments here. The last bullet there regarding cardiac ischemia will be removed. Uh, next page is on Vansatron. Uh, any issues uh, here? Uh, thank you for including the commentary about QT syndrome. That's a big, uh, that's a big one. I've certainly seen that actually result in cardiac arrest in, the, in, in a couple patients in my career, so thank you for that. Um, all right, no further comments there. Oxytocin, uh, no issues found. Uh, phenylephrine nasal spray. Uh, so uh, one comment on this one. Um, can we ask you guys to uh, just verify, there's a couple drugs here that's, that are um, between the beta agonist and epinephrine and phenylephrine, where we talk about alpha and beta receptors, can we just pick one format? Some pages it's spelled out, and other pages you use the Greek lettering. Can we just pick one format and stick with it throughout the document? Which is your preference? Uh, like, for example, if you go back to norepinephrine, it's spelled out um, beta 1 and alpha 1 and alpha is written out. Yeah, I see that too. The spell out. Yeah, so yeah, so I, I don't care which one you use. It probably makes more sense to just spell it out um, explicitly because I don't know if many paramedics are familiar with the Greek lettering. So, Lou, thank you, Dr. Castro. This is Matt Shaw. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, just going back to to own Dancitron, um our, uh, our OB docs up here have requested us not to administer it in first trimester of pregnancy. So I wasn't sure if we should maybe add that as a precaution or if that's not widespread, then we don't need to at all. You know, my understanding of the literature is that it probably doesn't justify, uh, in, my, in my practice, I can't justify uh, using a, as broad a statement as, as that as, as contraindic a strict contraindication. This is very, uh, the research is very limited right now. There's some studies that have a suggestion and other studies that don't. And then it has to be weighed against the, the you know, continued vomiting of the, of the pregnant mother and, and the negative repercussions that that also introduces. Um, in, in, it's my personal practice that, um, that, you know, I have a conversation with the patient about risks and benefits and, and we move on from there after some collaborative decision making. Um, I, I welcome any comments from the group about this. That's fine with me. I just wanted to bring it up. Franco, this is Amber. That's not a widespread contraindication in the Southern Arizona region. We use it pretty freely and we have not gotten any um, sort of feedback or pushback to eliminate the use um, in any patients from our OBGYN groups done. Perfect. Uh, that's a great uh, concern though. Thank you for bringing that up. It, it has come up from time to time from uh, questions from my patients, but thank you. Um, so oxytocin we covered, phenylephrine we covered, uh, we're on pralidoxine auto injector, no, no issues were noted on that page. 
Next is Preparacane Ophthalmic. Uh, no issues there. Um, there's a comment about Morgan lenses. Do, do we generally stock those in, on the ambulance? Those are only uh, in the agencies. talk box list. <clears throat> All right, uh, next issue next uh, is rocky uranium. No issues were identified on that page. Uh, sodium bicarbonate, uh, no issues uh, there. Um, actually, uh, actually, yeah, let's go, let's hold here. So, um, sodium bicarbonate under indications we have cardiac arrest and tricyclic antidepressant overdose, but we actually use it in extremity trauma and that's not listed under indications. Pick up. We should add in uh, hyperkalemia. Oh, sorry, it's Josh Gaither. So your Go question is, should we add in bicarb to prevent hyperkalemia? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yes. As in prophylactic, prophylactic treatment of an entrapped extremity. Is this for crush right, injury? Right. For, oh, this is Amber. For crush injury specifically? Yes. And then, uh, and then, Gail, don't we, don't we have it as a broader indicator for hyperkalemia as well? I think it's uh, it's listed more under the hyperkalemia algorithm. I think links into the extremity trauma. So I think probably the indication should be include hyperkalemia. So just, uh, sorry, it's Josh Gaither again. Just for discussion sake, and I'm fine keeping it in there. That That is a common use. We did do a least recent literature review on this topic, um, and uh, bicarb is not actually an effective treatment for hyperkalemia. Um, it's not recommended, and although um, <clears throat> bicarb in and of itself is fine, it has to do with the hypertonic solution in, in which we give it in the field. Um, because it's so hypertonic, uh, it doesn't actually change potassium concentrations in any significant way. So just some food for thought. I, I'm, that's a bigger discussion probably for some other time. I'm fine leaving it on this protocol or on this uh, drug profile. Give me, uh, bear with me, just give me two minutes here. I'm just leaking through my CT3Gs, just one second here. So it looks like everywhere we put down hyperkalemia treatment, we're only including calcium and albuterol. And so it looks like we are using it only in the trauma indication. Just, just a reminder in terms of the drug profiles, they're kind of more of a standalone item that are used for paramedic students in most of the training programs, kind of basically educating paramedic students on what the drug is, how it works. So that's why it's sometimes important for us to include things in here that may not necessarily tie back to an actual guideline, part of the knowledge base that they should get in their paramedic program. Should we keep the cardiac arrest at all? Uh, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, I, can, I see that with TCA overdose. Okay, that, that's reasonable. Um, well then, yeah. My only my only request is that since we have a reference to the extremity trauma page, we should probably add that one bullet point under indications that says, you know, uh, um, it considered uh, uh, considered helpful um, in crushing in crush syndrome or crush injury. That's a great point, Franco. Um, and uh, I've been. Teaching regarding crush injury, uh, if it's of any lengthy duration, I use that as an indication for 12 lead just to assess for uh, sine wave like changes. All right, so yeah, so if we have no objections, if we could just add one bullet point that references back the crush syndrome, uh, then we can, uh, we'll, uh, we can move forward. Franco, this is Amber. Just one more comment. So as we're talking, so I'm trying to, you know, take Gail's point as this is a somewhat educational document. When we look at the indications and precautions, we say use it for cardiac arrest. 
but then in the precautions it says may result in as many problems and resuscitation as acidosis. I, I, I don't think those two different bullet points are clear in this document as to how they interact with each other. I just I, maybe removing one or the other, you know, I, I get it in, in tricyclic overdoses for cardiac arrest. Um, but the precaution, I don't know if that's just confusing the point if we add that in the precautions also. Uh, so why don't we delete the first indication bullet point that specifically says cardiac arrest, keep the second one that addresses tricyclic antidepressant overdose and keep it vague. Okay. And then keep the keep the precaution bullets as they are. Okay. Uh, I think though, just to step back on that one, most of the guidelines of why of where we're using this have been in the hyperkalemia setting, just to kind of, even though there might be a questionable discussion on that, I think that's probably more likely where people are using it. To me, it makes more sense to take away this that bullet under precautions and side effects. Okay. I agree that the, having them both is confusing, but I think it's probably more of an academic thing for a paramedic student, and it's, you know, okay. problems in resuscitation, but I'm open on that one. Uh, yeah, my only, uh, my only comment otherwise would be that, you know, we don't include it explicitly in any cardiac arrest algorithm um, at, at all. And, uh, I'm not sure which one makes the most sense to keep or delete in that and, you know, when you take that into consideration. Um, does anybody have any specific comments on on, the, on its use during cardiac arrest, regardless of, of etiology? Does anybody have a, have a hard stop for that or anything? No, I don't think it's a hard stop. I, I just, the precautions and side effects one, I think is the one that's causing me the most heartache, <laughs> I guess. It's just because it, if we're gonna recommend it in the indications for resuscitation, um, I, I don't know that, the, that a very vague statement about it in the precautions is helpful or if it just creates more questions. That's, that was my, like my main issue with it. Okay. All right. Um, uh, I mean, you, you, both of you make a sound argument uh, um, otherwise. And so if it makes more sense to just delete the second bullet point under precautions, then, then uh, yeah, let's do that. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, the precautions and side effects for sodium bicarb, the second bullet should be removed. Uh, the, the one that starts with this may result in, uh, that will be removed and the indications will remain the same. And then we, were, we will add an, an, another indication for crush syndrome. And. Uh, um, I don't know about you guys, but as I'm staring at my computer screen, the COVID emails are coming in at about one per one per half minute, half set, half minute, one every thirty <laughs> seconds. Uh, uh, amazing. Okay. All right, so um, uh, succinylcholine is the next one, uh, page uh, forty-six. Succinylcholine, uh, no issues identified. Uh, next is a tetracaine, uh, no issues other than the time of onset. Where, I'm sorry, the peak effect, which, which I, don't, I don't have any objections there. Uh, thiamine, uh, no issues. Uh, vasopressin, uh, again, we'll back for the moment uh, as it, uh, it's going to come up on a different action item. Verapamil, uh, verapamil uh, there's going to be uh, a potential action item there, so we'll hold off on that. Uh, then finally, that takes us to the, uh, the tables. Are, are we including um, these tables just to show the, the no, yeah, no. go ahead. Uh, we need to vote on that on the drug profile. That's the action item currently. Uh, 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 correct, yes. Uh, let's, uh, let's see here. Uh, we have it listed as separate, as separate action 
action item. So right now we're on action item E, which is to uh, uh, discuss and then approve this drug profile. Um, we don't talk about the specific drugs until the uh, later action items. Well, this is Amber, motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Second, Jason. I second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of approving the drug profile uh, uh, with the amendment just discussed, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Next item uh, uh, will be to discuss, amend, and approve adding high flow nasal cannula to the paramedic scope of practice. Um, uh, bad timing on this is we're probably not going to recommend that these be used in a few months. But um, uh, Dr. Johnson, if you want to, uh, uh, can I get a, uh, uh, a, a motion to uh, begin discussion? Uh, Dr. Johnson, you want to carry through this? Yep. Yeah, and I apologize. I oh, we're getting feedback. Okay. I apologize. I have everything printed out for everybody, but no one is here. So um, I, I'll just go through briefly what I have. I think most of us are familiar with what the high flow nasal cannula is. Most commonly, it's the ramjet or vapotherm, similar type of things. Uh, they're used a lot more, especially with pediatric kids. I don't, we don't need, don't need, we just need to get a motion to add discuss so before you keep going. So we just need okay. <laughs> a motion to discuss. Looking at myself? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now we're good. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> a little hit. All right. So does anyone have any questions about what cannula is? So then I'm just going to go into it. Franco asked me to uh, get some specific information on it uh, as well as um, studies that have been done about it showing the efficacy. The big thing is this bridge is better than using standard nasal cannula. And sometimes you can, if they do well on it, you can prevent intubation. Uh, and it's similar to uh, like a BiPAP but less invasive. Uh, I also looked up agencies on the country that are hold up two of them just for sake of time. Uh, the one out of Maine from uh, the state of Maine and their uh, their DHS, they have protocols similar to ours, and then there they actually specifically have it on their pediatric airway algorithm to consider addition of high flow nasal cannula. Um, to uh, prior to intubation or if not meeting oxygenation goals. Uh, the other one that I brought up uh, was Washington. I actually kind of picked them because of everything that was going on with COVID at the time. And in theirs, they have a specific and procedures and I'll just read how they wrote it. Uh, they said personnel may transport patients determined by the sending physician as requiring oxygen therapy, high flow nasal cannula, High flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy comprises an air oxygen blender, an active humidifier, a single heated uh, circuit, and a nasal cannula. Uh, if the delivery adequately, it, I'm sorry, it delivers adequately heated and unhumidified medical gases up to 60 liters per minute of flow and is considered to have a number of. There's some detail about that. Procedures in this uh, place. Uh, so it's mostly used in facility. The reason I brought it up is, especially during the winter when we're up north and the uh, no lights are going out, we don't have anyone who can transport these because currently it's not within the paramedic scope of practice in Arizona.
This is Brian. I have a question. Hello? Go ahead, yeah, Brian. Go ahead. Okay. Does this require special equipment to uh, to be able to utilize? Yes, which would be, I mean, you, you have to have oxygen, obviously, but if they're, depending on which brand you use, there's, like I said, there's Vapotherm and Ram Cannula are the two big ones. The actual equipment itself isn't anything terribly special. The cannula just looks a little bit thicker than what you would normally use with a little bit bigger prongs that goes into the nares. Outside of that, they have like a, depending on the company, they have a humidifier and a heater that's a blend and it just blows that into there. But the big thing is the actual caliber of the, the tubing and the, the prongs that go up into the nose. So that's why it's not, I know in Maine they actually have it as listed. They can use it pre-hospital and in Washington it's predominantly in a facility. One of the things that we wanted to just kind of bring up to discussion and get this group's thought on is essentially this is a type of CPAP. And so CPAP is within scope of practice. Right. And you may actually not necessarily need to make any changes. Uh, we just may need to have some clarification language so people understand that. But I wanted to get this group's thoughts on that as I'm not a pediatric specialist, haven't done these in a long time. Right. And that's my thought too is, that, you know, it's, it's basically the same idea, but a little, it's actually less invasive of the CPAP that they're already doing. And, you know, I, I think it'd be fine even if we added it into there are, if we have some other language that states that CPAP, including high flow nasal cannula or something to that effect. Franco, this is Amber. Um, so, oh, go ahead, Josh. Um, I think from a, science perspective, I, this is one of the rare times in which we have really good pre-hospital literature to say this is something that is good for patients, it's better than CPAP. Um, I think I would support it 100%. I agree with Gail also. Um, I think we could slide this in under this uh, CPAP. It is a continuous positive pressure system that's just delivered through the nose at a different oxygen flow. So, yes and yes. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, Amber. Um, I, I was going to almost comment the same thing as Josh. I will say that NISEMSO in their guidance documents lists it with CPAP and BiPAP together as non-invasive ventilation. So I think I think from a um, sort of rules perspective, it would be safe to include with the other forms of non-invasive ventilation. All right. So um, do I hear any objections uh, to the point being made that it could be slipped in under other forms of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, that the evidence seems to be very supportive, uh, uniquely so. Uh, any objections at this point? Quick question, if you, if you got a second. Go ahead. The question is, would this also be for initiation out in the field or would it just be for non-emergency uh, non transport for paramedics? It would be both the way you're wording that. Right. And that's what I, when I read around the country, Washington specifically has theirs as inner facility, but the other states that I'd looked at, it was, they just left it open to either. Data is so supportive yeah. and the risk is so minimal. I think that it would be fine to use for both. Yeah. I'm going to say, I don't know any reason why you wouldn't use it in a, in a, in a scene call type of scenario. Correct. Would we make this an STR or would we just leave it up to the medical directors of each agency? I, so I think this is considered, I don't, so I think if we consider this a type of uh, essentially non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, it's within scope. And so I don't think we would actually need to make any changes. Maybe just a simple line that says including high flow nasal cannula or other de that's, similar that's, device. Can't really change the scope table, so we can just provide guidance if we get questions regarding that. Any changes, even kind of an explanation, involves opening the scope practice table. But I think this is, if we all agree that this is a type of NIPPV, then essentially this makes it within scope as it is. Okay, perfect. 
right, so can I get a motion to approve? Jason? I think this will be a, uh, sorry, just to clarify, since we are not actually adding anything, this would be a motion, we would okay. need a motion to table, since we're not making any adjustments. And do we need a okay, pretty, so can I get pretty a clarification in the document? Okay. Got it. So, so there's, this is going to be more of a document wording clarification, not a motion to approve. So we would need a motion to table. I'll motion to table with the plan to do the wording for it. I don't think any second. Where's the, where's the wording going to? I'll wait for a second. I'll make a second. Then okay. where, where, where's the plan that this is going to go? This will be clarification language if we get asked by any agency who would like to implement this. Okay. All right. Uh, can I get um, all those in favor of tabling this motion? Uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries to table this issue. Uh, next is going to be item D, discuss, amend, and approve making dopamine and norepinephrine optional agents on table one. Uh, the idea here is that, um, uh, that that the prevailing evidence seems to support uh, simplifying uh, on, in a broad manner the use of vasopressors across the scope of EMS. Um, the central region has just um, uh, modified their uh, guidelines to use push dose epinephrine across the board for any carry arrest or shock positions as a single agent for simplification of training and administration. Um, as such, uh, dopamine and norepinephrine would be essentially uh, 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 not used and rendered moot. Um, and so the item is being brought back to this committee uh, to see if there could even be any broader acceptance of such a practice uh, statewide. So, Franco, I think we again need the motion and a second if we're going to discuss. This is a motion to discuss. I heard Amber Rice for first, who was second? Yes. Okay, open for discussion. Jason seconded. Um, any, any discussion? Franco, I think that, I mean, I would support, like, personally, as long as there is a requirement that they carry a vasopressor agent, um, agencies that choose to eliminate dopamine over push dose pressors, you know, I, don't, I just don't know that there's enough data that's clear either way. Um, but, but I think that the agency should have the requirement to at least carry one vasopressor agent. And would you be, would it be a, a sufficient if epinephrine was that agent? Because epinephrine at this point would still be considered mandatory. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's very mixed literature on push dose epi in the pre-hospital setting. Um, there's very limited data. Um, but there's also relatively limited data on dopamine as well. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know if others that want to weigh in here, but yeah, I think that I think that in light of previous conversations that I've had with other medical directors, dopamine simply isn't getting used. Um, when I talk to medics in the field, many of them have never ever used a dopamine drip ever. Um, so yes, pro maybe dopamine could be better over push dose epi, but if it's never being used ever, then I don't know that it's um, better to keep it as a requirement if there are options that agents are, that they're maybe more likely to use in situations that are indicated. So that's sort of my take on it. So, so, and looking at the table, 
that since the since since this is to discuss and amend making it optional, uh, there's a couple of potentials we could put if we want to have one or the other, we could we could uh, just put one or the other, nor epinephrine or dopamine in the supply amount, or we could just add optional in front of the 400 milligrams of dopamine, and both of them would be optional. Epinephrine is still going to be required to be carried because of other stuff, and medical directors can choose it to use it for push dose epi like we have been up here. Correct. I would favor Brian's second example where norepinephrine and dopamine would be listed as optional and then no change to the current epinephrine profiles which, uh, which are used for other indications and then can be extrapolated to use as push dose. And, and just so there, we did run the numbers on use of the medication just to get an idea. So in Arizona, across the entire state, there were 140 uses of uh, dopamine in 2019. However, when you actually open those, several of those, the dose was zero, so potentially a crew split it out, put it on their run sheet, but then they didn't actually administer it. Uh, several of these agencies, the dose, uh, they were actually flight agencies. So the overall numbers across the entire state of Arizona for you know, ground 911 non-RN crews is probably closer to the 125 to 130 range. So it's a pretty low number for the entire state for 2019, just so people are aware. So um, are there any voices in opposition to making these two items optional? So the, uh, the idea would be uh, uh, when we vote, it, it would be listing dopamine and more epinephrine in their current um, uh, forms as optional and then no change to the epinephrine uh, uh, listings. Hearing no opposition, can we get a motion to uh, approve? So moved. Ryan. Second. Any seconds? Zambar, second. Uh, all those who approve uh, making these agents optional say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, so uh, these, uh, the motion carries. Uh, next item is the uh, discuss, amend, and approve removal of activated charcoal from table one. Can I get a motion to discuss? So moved. Brian. So moved. Second, Matt. Second. Thank you. Uh, so uh, again, this is a, a, a consequence of uh, 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 prevailing information that suggests that this um, medication is generally not getting used uh, um, in the EMS pre-hospital setting. And so uh, the uh, re uh, request is to consider removing it altogether. Open for discussion. Uh, this was another where we did run the numbers for the state of Arizona as well. Uh, if we localize this down to uh, 911 units, there were 33 uses in 2019. Anybody opposed outright? No, no I would, I'm surprised there were that many people using it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, Brian. <laughs> I've, I've, had a, I've had quite a few people coming even from out of state um, into the state, and I queried them during their orientation about this, and I haven't got anybody yet, even from out of state, who's had an affirmative use on this. So let's go ahead and uh, move to vote all those uh, uh, for removal of activated charcoal. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
May the ayes have it and motion passes. Next action item, discuss amend and approve removal of uh, Nalmathene from table one. Uh, can I get a motion to discuss? So moved, Amber. Brian. So moved. Second, Amber. Okay, we got Brian and Amber. Thank you. Open for discussion. Amber, do you want to? I think you had some good notes on this. There were issues with manufacturer availability and a couple other things. Can you summarize for us? Yeah, this is this is not on the market in the United States currently. It's being fast tracked by the FDA um, for use in opioid overdose, but there is no nalmaphene on the market in the United States right now. Uh, any, 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 go ahead. There has been zero uses that we've been able to find in our system. <laughs> the only, the only, uh, the only uh, uh, counter comment would be that if this is getting fast tracked to come back on the market and opioid overdose is still a high profile issue, does it behoove us to keep it for now? Uh, this is Amber. I I kind of don't think so because there are some issues with it being a very long acting medication that I think should be discussed within this committee before we to recommend it, approve it, or put it on any kind of list associated with um, treatment for EMS. And and it was only added on here many years ago because we were having some severe shortages of naloxone which is probably not gonna happen given the current um, desire to have lots of naloxone. Thank you for, Agreed. That, uh, for that comment. Yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and move to a vote. All those who approve uh, removal of Almathene, uh, uh, please say aye. 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 Aye, any opposed? All right, the motion carries. Next item, discuss amend and approve removal of verapamil from table one. Can I get a motion to discuss? Move, Jason. Don't move. Second, Jason Brian. And the second, second is Brian, thank you. Uh, so uh, the issue here is that this uh, is really down to one or two agencies that even carry this medication anymore. Uh, we, uh, the, the far prevailing medication that is most commonly used is Zopiazem. Um, there was an issue that came up a few years ago while we had a pretty substantial Diltiazem shortage uh, where it was argued that uh, verapamil, uh, keeping verapamil on the, uh, on the uh, table would be a reasonable alternative, but the counter argument was that it would create substantial patient safety concerns with training and lack of familiarity on the part of providers for a disease process that very rarely uh, is considered life or death uh, in the pre-hospital setting, um, and when it is, um, there is, there are other electrical therapies that can be relied upon. Uh, and so, in light of that, uh, we now find ourselves on the uh, 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 looking at uh, considering its removal. Any comments? So, my only concern is the last time this came up for discussion, I believe you noted that one of the largest EMS agencies in Arizona is still carrying that. Is that true today? Uh, Brian, their medical director who had to sign off the phone confirmed with me that they are planning on discontinuing the use of the Diltiazem. Okay. The, the only and reason so, so, is, just be, is because of the concerns on, on uh, some people's perception on the, on the refrigeration of the liquid version and I guess their preference not to carry uh, the advantage system or whatever, so. And so, Gail, just so it's on record, you said that that particular agency no longer has that concern. Is that, I didn't quite hear you. I did, before we confirmed putting this on the agenda, I did speak uh, to the current medical director for that agency and they have stated that they are in the process of transitioning. And this okay. still need to fit. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Gamer had to uh, leave the meeting, but he, you know, definitely this would have to go to NBC to be official anyhow. Uh, so there will be an opportunity for one last time. But uh, the conversation was had that um, they do feel that they are going to be transitioning. Okay. Can I? Uh, um, so if there is no opposition at this point, can we go ahead and move for a vote? All those who approve uh, removal of vasopressin and say aye. 
Hi. Hi. I, I believe it was verapamil, not vasopressin. Sorry, verapamil, thank you. Okay. Then yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries verapamil removal. Next item, discuss submit and approve removal of vasopressin from table one. Can I get a motion to discuss? So moved. Matt. Amber second. Thank you. Uh, does anybody want to comment on this uh, on this motion? I can give some data on this as well. So uh, when we when we actually isolate down vasopressin uh, to nine one one, initially we thought that it was used um, one hundred nineteen times, but then we actually kind of took out air air ambulance uh, use of it. And then went down to 911 use of it, and then it got down to two utilizations in uh, 2019. With a question, we actually included if, if we didn't couldn't tell who was administering it, it was less blank. We just assumed that it was an EMCT, uh, but certainly could have been an RN. So if it was not documented what level of person was giving it, we included that. Any comments from anyone else or any specific uh, um, opposition to its removal? And what was the reason for wanting to remove it? Just that it's not being used all that often? Well, it's been removed from every, it's been removed from the like cardiac arrest guidelines. So that was the mostly the one indication for 911 use. Inner facility might use it for as a vasopressor. Um, for shock, but in terms of cardiac arrest use, it's been virtually eliminated. Yeah, and I would, it's Josh Gaither, I'm sorry. I would echo what Amber just said. This was a drug that we were all super excited about 15 years ago. It was going to be the next great life saving drug, and unfortunately, it just didn't pan out. Um, I think it's time has come to just kind of slide off the table. Um, yeah. If there's no opposition, let's go ahead and move to a vote. Uh, those who uh, uh, support removal of vasopressin to table one say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Next item, discuss amend and approve removal of oxytocin from table one. Can I get a motion to discuss? Amber, we have one agency, as far as I know, in the southern Arizona region that still has it on their list. Um, the have eliminated it, but I have one still use it. So, this is Heather and Kingman, and Dr. Merrill and I are here. We still have it on ours as well, just because of the long transport times that we have. We have we could have up to a two-hour transport time depending on different areas. Yeah, this is Matt and Flagstaff. We uh, we still have it on ours, uh, also for the long transport time. I I did like a query from 2010 till present. We've only administered it five times, but uh, I'm not sure that that its low use is a reason to necessarily get rid of it, especially with the prolonged transport times. If you have someone that's in postpartum hemorrhage coming from Tucson, you know, to Flagstaff, that's you know 60 to 90 minutes. And and, and we have some other agencies that. Are still ha on handwriting, and they don't. They very occasionally use it, um, and in fact, we just added it into our treatment guidelines in September for intramuscular injections um, under a standing order, which we haven't had before. So, uh, Gail, do we do you have any data on statewide use to share? Yeah. From from the actual documented use of it, there is uh, seven or eight, depending on which table you look at. In, in, in one year? In one year, correct. Uh, seven in um, 2018, seven in 2019. Any, anybody else want to go on record with any specific comments before we take it to a straight vote? Okay, all those in favor of removing oxytocin, uh, say aye. And uh, please, uh, uh, would, would it be helpful, Shelley, to get names on this one? 
If you want to do a roll call vote, we can do that. Uh, and just as an FYI, it is not in the Nisemso list of medications. Just one last comment. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's do it. I'm sure this this is going to be a little, little bit more contentious, and uh, this isn't personal or anything. I just want to make the vote count easy for Shelley, so that it's clearly on record. Um, can we go ahead and get a roll call vote? All right, Amber Rice and I vote would indicate that you approve removal. Uh, Brian and I vote would indicate that you approve removal. Nay. Uh, Chester, he. Chester and Heather Miller are in the same room, and we both vote not to remove it. Okay. A nay vote registered for Chester and Heather. Uh, Dr. Castro Marin. Just to make sure we're getting Hello, only committee members. Recap quorum. And then, I'm sorry, Dr. Castamarin, you vote to remove it or not to remove it? I, I vote to remove. I vote to remove. Dr. Johnson? So a nay vote is to keep. Uh, Jason Payne? Nay. I to remove. Nay to keep. Dr. Gaither? Uh, yes, remove. Nay to keep the drug on. Josh, yay or nay? Yay to keep or nay to? Yay. yay. I, and I'm putting a, you down for an I to remove. Is that correct? Correct. Matt Shaw? Nay. Neil Gago? Yay, to remove. I to remove. Um, and is Sherry Brown still on? Uh, she had to sign off. I just was asking if she's back on. She's been coming on and off. Uh, four I votes to remove, and I have one, two. Vote nay to keep on. So the motion failed. Can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, I've got four I votes to remove and six nay votes to keep. So the motion failed. Okay. Uh, so the motion uh, to remove uh, oxytocin uh, fails. Next item uh, discuss, amend, and approve, treat, and refer the treat and refer. Uh, T3 genes, attachment 5J. I got a motion to discuss. So moved. Brian, so seconded. Matt. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody online that can kind of walk us through your brands and discuss quickly? Uh, so I will just give a little bit of background on this. So this is was an ask for the treat and refer program that we have optional guidelines. So any medical, any agency that applies for treat and refer, their medical director has to sign and decide what treatment guidelines their agency would use. So this is just an optional template for an agency's medical director to decide if they would like to use or not. There's no obligation to use this. They can make any adjustments. So purely, purely optional. Gail, this is Amber. My, um, none of my agencies personally use these, but um, I do think that they'd be pretty well supported by some of the other more rural agencies and some of the agencies that do use these. Um, the feedback that I've heard is that they would be um, very well accepted. And I apologize for my ignorance, Gail, but where did the content come from? The content for this, this was taken from the original uh, the original treat and refer program, the ADHS uh, website, we had several different agencies and regional uh, versions. We kind of cross-referenced those to the new versions of the TTTG and try to get them into the same format and make sure the medicine matched. But there isn't any like accepted template out there because no one else is doing treat and refer. So this is very Arizona specific. 
Is there anything specific that you want to highlight, any controversial issues, treatment controversies, or anything like that? I don't think so. I mean, I think these, like I said, this is just to make sure that if some, if we are going to post any kind of treatment guidelines, we wanted to make sure that it goes to the normal committee process of PMD to MDC. Uh, and again, any agency that does treat and refer their own medical director would have to decide whether or not they would like to utilize these. Okay. Can we get a motion to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, can we, uh, 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 if there's no further discussion, I'll uh, go ahead and take a vote. Those who uh, approve or uh, would like to vote to approve these, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, the motion carries. Uh, let's see, let me get it back to my agenda here. Um, that covers the discussion and action items. Uh, agenda items to be considered for the next meeting. Any call to the public? And uh, a summary of events, suddenly this, the slate looks very clear. Um, yeah, everything's canceled. Is the, is the July Western Pediatric Trauma Camp Conference also canceled then or no? I'd have to just go with a full uh, cancellation of this whole section. Okay, That's gotcha. All right. Uh, then the next meeting is July 16th, 2020 at 1200 hours. Uh, uh, to be determined in terms of uh, location or tele, uh, telecommute. Um, otherwise, uh, we will adjourn this meeting at uh, 1528. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Big thank you for everyone for participating via phone and computer. We really appreciate that. Thank you.